today is a very special day. We have got Hunt Doherty here on the line with us. What up, Hunt? Not much. How's it going? Oh man, I am I am so pumped to to see you. So Hunt is uh, t tell us a little bit. You're you're previs and you're an asset lead at Third Floor. Yeah, so I worked for almost seven years at the the Third Floor. They're a visualization company, uh, working on previs, postvis, techvis, really anything. Um, I got my start as a asset builder, um, building everything from characters, environments, uh, vehicles, props, and then kind of slowly moved into to doing postvis as well, um, where we mock up uh, mock up effects and kind of you know build what the final shot is ultimately going to look like um, during post-production, uh, as well as tech viz and a little bit of virtual production stuff too. So a little, little bit of everything. Super cool, man. How long um, have you been doing this? Uh, about seven years. So I've been, uh, been at it a while. Um, it's cool because, it, it, you know, every project's different and uh, it's uh, always, always something new. Um, so you always have to kind of think on your feet and, and come up with different solutions to, to things. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a good job if you like variety and, uh, just always having, having something new to deal with. It's yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. What, what did you, how did you decide or how'd you get into, uh, wanting to be an asset lead? Um, it was kind of by accident, you know, um, I originally went to school for industrial design and, uh, you know, uh, after working as like, uh, doing a little product design stuff for a couple of years. I decided I want to focus more on 3D modeling. So I went back to school at uh, Noman in Hollywood. Nice. And, uh, you know, went in just thinking I wanted to be a modeler and didn't really know, uh, you know, where I was going, if it was video games or film. And uh, kind of learned about Previs um, just through, you know, people at, at Noman and, uh, and was lucky enough to get in uh, through to the third floor that way. Gotcha. Um, well, of course, your much of your career is nowadays shrouded in secrecy. Um, <laughs> yeah. But how much of of this are we allowed to talk about? How much of what you've done in the past? I know we can't talk about what you're doing now, but like a couple of years yeah. ago, I can you talk can, about. You know, you can see the stuff that's on my IMDb. So I've worked on a lot of superhero movies, uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, third floor has worked on you know theme park rides, uh, shows, movies. Um, so there, there's a whole lot of variety, you know. And uh, the my probably my favorite one that I've worked on um, that I can talk about is, is I worked on Captain America three for for a long time. So that was cool getting to you know work on the assets and then again on the the post side. So it was uh, it was pretty cool. Super rad. What's it? What kind of timelines do you usually work on? Um, usually, you know, the the big thing with us is we start really early on. In production, so everything can change, obviously, um, on any show. Uh, so we, we do everything in real time in Viewport. We don't render anything, per se. It's all play blasts and, and Viewport 2.0 stuff, uh, just to be able to keep up with the, with the changes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I'm a big, you know, proponent of doing everything, like keeping it fast and loose, but also organized, you know, and just being ready to anticipate changes and and things like that. What do you think is, is the, if you could say like the thing that, that drives you the most, that you're most excited about doing in this work? Um, just in general, it's just making, making cool stuff. Really. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of what it boils down to just seeing, seeing, and seeing that stuff come to life. Um, cause I'm not much of an animator uh, at all. So, you know, I'll, I'll be on kind of in the beginning, uh, when we're creating all these worlds and characters and vehicles and stuff, and then to see people kind of bring them to life. And then, you know, if it is a post for the show, you know, ground it, you know, come back around and, and start to see it in plates and integrated with live action stuff is, is really cool. And would you, would you consider yourself a generalist of sorts? Yeah, I'd say I'm a, a generalist. I try and do a little bit of everything, you know, really always, always just trying to figure out new methods and, and techniques and just messing around. Um, and that's, that's the great thing about the Kit Bash sets is, you know, like having a full-time job that's very secret. Like there's not a whole lot of time to create a city if I wanted to mm -hmm. just at home in my spare time. So it, it's a cool thing to be able to uh, just be at like 80% out of the gate 
and just start making stuff in your free time, uh, which is really, really cool. And I've, I've enjoyed uh, playing around with them. When I first saw it, I was like, oh, this is really cool, you know, because it's, you know, building building cities can be really time consuming. Um, and it, everything we do, we'll, we'll build with a lot of accuracy, especially like if it's a, a location, you know, so uh, it's just a time consuming thing. And it, you know, having it as a job, even though it's cool, really takes it out of you. So mm-hmm. to, to be able to have those assets available just to start making stuff like right out of the gate was super intriguing uh, immediately for me. Awesome, man. Well, we, um, we of course, have loved seeing the, the things that you've been shooting out. Um, but let's take a look at this. So this is um, this is the, the play blast that you sent me using Utopia. Yeah. So what kind of time does this represent for your workload? Uh, really, it's probably, you know, I, I've had it for a couple weeks and just doing like 30 minutes an hour here and there every night, you know, just after, after getting home from work uh, and just kind of breaking it down that way. Um, obviously, I added little things here and there to it. So, you know, like one night it's like, all right, I'm going to do some, some low-res vehicles. I'm going to do some, some crowds. Uh, it's, it's really just trying to kind of compartmentalize it and, and do a little bit uh, every night. And also just exploring, too. Um, you know, because this isn't really a shot. It's more just like a fly through through the city. Yeah. So uh, just kind of finding the right layout and, and camera and just kind of playing, you know, like moving some buildings and adjusting the camera, then... Uh, a little bit of back and forth that way, just trying to, to find some cool stuff and, you know, also repurposing some pieces, um, you know, like making that into some kind of digital sculpture there. And mm-hmm. like all these walkways, I think were rooftops originally on, on other buildings and kind of extruding them out and using them to connect things. So just trying to discover stuff as I move things around. Super cool. I love, I love that. And I think I think this is one of the my favorite parts about previs is how how far you can push something all the way. You know, I mean, and the what would end up on screen, you know, would take so many more artists to get to, <laughs> yeah. to get to where we are. But you've got like we get the whole feeling of an entire shot. I mean, this could be the opening of literally any scene, and you you were able to do it all on your own in just a, a couple a couple evening sessions. I think that's so amazing. Yeah, it, it's it's really fun because you know it it starts to you know by having vehicles fly around and, and having uh, all the different um, things going on, it, it can really start to spur ideas. You're like, oh man, I, I wish I'd done this, or I really want to go into this section and, and add more stuff. Um, so it, it's it's really just kind of going in and, and making a little world and then finding interesting areas to the de- to develop further. Droki's got a question for you. He says on the previs side. What is the main challenge or need that you are being given, as in figuring out camera timing, the assets that need to be created, et cetera? Uh, it's it's really everything. Like when I'm on the asset side, we'll we'll have a you know like a sequence in mind, and, and we'll know for the most part what needs to be done. So we'll we'll break down like an asset list. Like all right, here are the environments. Uh, it could be based on a set or a location, or it could just be made up. Um, so then when you're on the asset side, we'll we'll just go in and start focusing on that while either a storyboard artist or an animator will go in and start blocking shots and worrying about the timing. Uh, so yeah, between, you know, we have supervisor and uh, coordinators that we, we get it all kind of figured out and have a clear plan going in usually. I mean, never really go in line. So it's, it's pretty broken down and, and managed from the start. So we, you know, you have a pretty solid plan uh, just as far as all the assets and everything you have ready just so you know you're ready for any changes that come as the story develops the big thing with you know storyboards to previs is we can figure it out in real 3d space that you could then go in and shoot um because storyboards aren't always based in reality although a lot of storyboard artists are getting crazier and crazier and integrating uh-huh. sketchup and 3d uh-huh. stuff um so it is a lot more real world and i think that's the big thing is, is having all these cool ideas and maintaining them throughout the production um in a way that you can you can shoot. So then generally your workflow with, with something like this, what, what software do you start in and, and where do you go with it? 
Uh, with this, you know, again, I'm, I'm just at home, like, doing this stuff after work. So this was all Maya, pretty much. Um, textures, you know, I didn't even use that many textures, really. Um, I just built a few shaders that have uh, reflectivity and uh, got a few just tree cards uh, off textures.com. I'm trying to think, looking at it, what else I what else I got. It, it's pretty much just that, just simple things, you know, because if you start texturing something, you kind of have to texture everything, you know, right, so cool. just knowing where to where to choose the, the battles, you know, I, I built like a little water shader and, and things like that, but uh, yeah, for the most part, it's it's just Maya. Uh, I did a little bit of After Effects comping uh, on the other Play Blast, just, just for fun to see if I could make it pop a little more, mm -hmm. just experiment. Um, but other than that, mostly my. I don't think I use Photoshop at all, at all for this. So then, w walk me through just just a little bit of, of the the process of this. We go, you get your boards and you get your your references and you build this, and then from there, where, how does how does this work into the the major the rest of the team? You know, again, this is just like a fly through. If if there was a story or, or action beats happening, we'd probably find an area where we're going to do it. Um, if it wasn't based on a set and they would go in and start blocking the cameras and, and uh, an editor or somebody would, would start cutting it together and, you know, uh, try and do it in a way that's achievable, you know. So I'm kind of doing like the crazy impossible helicopter camera right now through uh -huh. all of this. Um, but just, you know, making it a little more based in reality and something that a, a film crew could, could shoot. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much it. Yeah, super rad. Well, here, there's this another version of this, this Toon Shade version you sent me, um, yeah. which I think is is super cool. What um, what did you do to to layer this in? Uh, that one, I, I just uh, crunched the levels a little bit in After Effects, and then also just put like a, a Toon Shade on, or I, th I think it's just called Toon is the effect in, mm -hmm. in After Effects, and. Uh, just again the same way you would kind of play around and, and look for happy accidents in, in Maya, mm -hmm. just laying things out. Uh, just did the, the same thing. I was like, oh, I usually don't do tune shaded stuff, but it, it looked kind of cool just because everything is so, uh, you know, white. It, yeah. I think it helped break it up a little bit um, because I didn't want to focus on textures and, and mm -hmm. uh, just to give it just kind of give it a cool little cartoon yeah. vibe that I kind of dug. We've seen our, our good buddy Alex Fagini on this show do uh, show some Toon Shade stuff, too. Um, oh, yeah. Well, how about we um, we break into one of your project files? Yeah. You know, if we look at this in perspective, whoa, we're way zoomed in on some super low-res people. Um, they're literally just the lowest, crappiest geometry you can, you can have. Um, but... Uh, and just on really simple animation cycles, you can see some of them even stop running because I, I just had them stop moving after the, the camera went by them. Uh -huh. It's pretty, you can see I really kind of built this to the camera. A lot of holes in the ground. Uh, you know, if, if, there was, if it was something that this was being designed for more than one shot, obviously we'd fill a lot of that in. But since this was more just kind of an exploratory thing, we didn't really... Uh, didn't really fill in the gaps, you know, because it's it's just about knowing what the, the final outcome is and, and managing the time. So, you know, instead of worrying about things like that, I just only made it look good on the camera. I love that. And I love that part of Previs where it's it's about getting to a destination fast. And you can, yeah. you can make things that, that really give the whole feeling without having to go through the, the, the painstaking detail that the finished projects. Yeah, definitely. And um, it... It just enables you to, to really move things around, and this scene file is kind of a mess right now, but it, it's the kind of thing, you know, um, sometimes you just have to move things around and, and find, you know, different places for them, or, you know, just having the ability to, to quickly move things around um, and, and change things up, you know, can really help discover um, new new ways to go down that, that you wouldn't before and I think that was something that was really always appealing to me with previs you know rather than like focusing on like a crazy final asset that has all sorts of uh, you know has all the color spec normal you know uh, maps just being able to, to really not commit to anything and, and um, 
and just keep developing the idea rather than just making a, a polished facet, um, you know, with all, with all the holes filled in. How do you decide when it's time to move on? Just, I just kind of, just kind of know, like, all right, that's, that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> cause it's, it's the kind of thing you could, I could noodle this forever, you know, right. I was already kind of getting to the point. It's like, I, I'm, I'm tired of this camera. I want to, I want to find some new views, but you know, just kind of sticking with it. And, uh, you know, it, it started to even get a little busy at the end because it's like, all right, there's a car flying in every direction. And then there's like a little flying train that comes by too. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, I kind of get to a point, especially when it's just for fun where I'm like, all right, enough is enough. I've, I've, uh, I've found some cool areas, you know, like there's definitely areas that I, I really like that I want to go in and explore some more. Are there pieces of this fly through that you can say are not necessarily signature hunt moves, but are they things that, that you find yourself doing a lot or quick tips or tricks in here that you, that you found really help you work fast? Maybe the, the example I'm looking at right now is, you know, like I, I started um, kind of layering things up so it, it wasn't just on a flat ground and there's nothing too extreme but you know I just having pieces kind of naturally um, you know it, it's not like a city grid like things kind of flowed into each other so it was just kind of an easy solution was to drop things down onto another layer and then uh, you can see like this bridge doesn't even connect um, but you know, I, I realized like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll have some bridges connect these things. And, and rather than model something, I, I just started looking within the kit um, for pieces that I could repurpose. And I, you know, let's uh, get out of the lit mode. Droki's got a question. He says, were the camera and large assets set up first and then the details added around the camera or was everything sort of evolving the whole time? Um, a little bit of evolving, um, again, because, you know, I'm, I'm not on anybody's schedule, really. Like, I, I started, I, I knew kind of what I wanted to do, so I, I had, uh, I made, like, little kits of the flying cars and, and people, because I, I knew that I wanted to have something on the small scale to kind of give life to the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of had that to start. I think this was kind of the, uh, the area I started blocking first. Not that. Um, so it kind of grew out from like this little section here, and uh, so it started on like one area, and then I grew it out from there, and kind of it snowballed into a big crazy fly through uh -huh. uh, from there. Um, so so beyond this area, once I had this like little layout, I, I kind of took it back further and, and, and thought like, okay, what's it going to look like to have an approach into this? And then it kind of I started grabbing other big buildings from the kit and, and moved some over there and, and just tried to find a good variety um, as, as far as uh, moving stuff around. And, you know, from from there, it, it, the, the layout did start to get dictated by the camera just because, uh, you know, I started grabbing it. It's a pretty straightforward path through. Um, this whole building here came pretty late because I, it was just kind of an op a much more open um area before uh you know before we got to this so you know there was there was a lot less going on there um it's not all grouped but uh you know it, it started a little wider so i kept going further and further back and, and building more and more into it and then same thing on the other direction i thought all right what if we followed one of these cars out of here and um just get to see a, a little bit of the, the depth and, and everything of how far back the, the city actually goes. You know, as you're kind of scrubbing through, like you just kind of get in a mode where you're, you're scrubbing and you're like, ah, what, what can I do to add to this? And it's just so easy to, to be able to say, all right, I'm going to, you know, put something over here or, or um, you know, uh -huh. just really it's, it's kind of like thumbnail or, or napkin sketching in, in 3D just to be able to really quickly um, – come up with these things um, and, and repurpose things and, you know, just discover different views and then, you know, having, the, yeah, like the, the flying trains, you know, is something I wish I could almost develop further. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, kind of a crossing through a, a lane of the, the hover traffic too was kind of a another accident, but I kind of liked how it, it you know, showed the depth and I, I think that's something I'd want to develop more is, is developing the traffic even more but uh, you know it, it's kind of like served its purpose now this this scene file but uh, mm -hmm. you know 
kind of gave me some good ideas just by going in there and, and messing around with stuff. Forrest Lamb asks a, a question. He goes, I wonder how heavy that scene is um, with so many objects. Um, um, yeah, you know, this is not a powerhouse computer by, by any means. Like, it's a, it's a four-year-old gaming laptop. So um, that's uh, another benefit of not using heavy textures. I feel like Maya's getting better at ha handling a lot of geometry. Mm -hmm. um, but once you start putting a bunch of even, like, 1K maps into this thing, um, my, my video card will, will start protesting pretty quickly. Um, but, yeah, you can see, like, especially when I'm in just gray-shaded mode, like, I'm, I'm scrubbing through with, with no problems. Super fast, um, yeah. That's crazy and that's, to think this is you an know, old laptop. Everything other than the, the city is, is pretty low res, but I think this scene file in particular is only like 300 megabytes. You know, I've, I've gotten like art department files that are like stuffed with detail, but uh, and that, it partly helps too, um, just building to the camera and, and duplicating things like once I kind of know the camera path because I, I can start to manage it if it gets a little too crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, when I when I don't have the lights on uh, or the textures, I, I can move around uh, pretty quickly. At any point, did you find once you got into textures and stuff that that it, it got too heavy for your machine, or were you able to to move pretty seamlessly without having to delete too much? I, I kind of knew the the limits of my machine going in, so I, I never intended to to fully texture, and I think it also because of how big of a camera move I, I did, I, I knew it was going to kind of go down the, the rabbit hole of spending too much time on the textures. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've even gotten the, the GPU limit exceeded once or twice on this, just from, you know, having tree and cloud cards and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, let's, let's turn the textures back on and see what happens. Again, I think it's trees, some clouds, sky dome. I think that's pretty much it, honestly. Everything else is procedural. Um, I, you know, use some environment balls on some of the, the white building material just to, to pump up the highlights so they look a little more interesting than just like a, a blend uh, shader. Yeah. But beyond that, um, yeah, so you can see it, it, it chugged a little um, turning on, but that's that's kind of standard even on a, a better machine with uh, Viewport 2.0. Yeah. Wow, cool. So you felt you feel like the the models are the right weight for for previs and what you're trying to do. They're in the, the sweet spot that you'd want them. Yeah, definitely. And you know, so even even some of these are, are probably you know if if I was going to bring in like fully rigged uh, characters and, and vehicles and stuff, because that's the one thing I, I don't have is anything with any character skinning or, or anything like that. Um, that's when it, it might start to get a little heavy, but mm -hmm. honestly, I, I think it, it could handle it. Um, and if this was like a, a previous environment, say like, you know, say that there was a scene happening in this little plaza, mm -hmm. um, once we know where the action is, we can really optimize based on that. Like we're never gonna go back to these buildings, so I could, you know, just, uh, isolate select all of these guys and um, either turn it into a card or, or something like that, right. um, or a series of cards, uh, just so there's still some parallax. Mm -hmm. um, that's all stuff that, that's pretty easy to do, you know? Yeah. So just always knowing, like, what what your outcome is. Like, where is your action taking place? Uh, you know, if, if it was a big, crazy, you know, flying car chase through a whole city, like, that, that's, that's another thing. Um, but... I, if that was the case, I think we could handle it. Um, I, I think it, it's totally um, well for sure, especially if it's running on this computer. That's a really awesome, just general rule of thumb to to know what your outcome is and, and have that in mind as you break out these things. Because I know it's really easy with the with you know our kids in particular to to want to just fill it with pieces and build a whole scene. And then I think you can do that, and then by by setting your camera moves through it, knowing really what you're going to end with, you can then work backwards from there. Yeah, yeah, and and that is the good thing. Like I was able to, you know, really lay things out um, without having to uh, worry about chugging or, or waiting for things to process, or you know, because that that's the kind of thing. Like if you have a, a supervisor or a client like over your shoulder, and you're like, oh, hold on, it's going to take five minutes. You know, you're going to lose people. So yeah. just always being able to to move things and, and get.
get discussions going um, is, is pretty crucial. Uh, same for, you know, this scene file is a bad example because I haven't really organized it, but just being able to quickly grab stuff, you know, so if, if a client or whoever says, you know, this building shouldn't be here or, you know, we should, we should rotate it 90 degrees. Obviously, you know, there's real world constraints sometimes, but um, when you're, when you're, this early on, or if it's a CD extension, like you, you do have that kind of flexibility to, to go in. And, you know, um, one thing I always see new artists doing is, if, you know, they're like, oh, somebody says move this building, and they're like, oh, hold on, this is grouped like that, and you got to start picking stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's just easy to, to lose people. Do you find that, that you're working usually with models at, at this weight, or are you finding you're oftentimes working with stuff lower poly? Um, no, it, it really depends, you know, again, uh, based on the show and art departments and, and everybody's getting so much more detailed nowadays. Yeah. Um, you can get a lot more, um, right out, right out of the, the gate. Um, so uh, this is pretty on par with, with what we would use, you know, like this, this kind of stuff isn't, isn't too heavy at all, you know? Um, and it's, it's easy to go in and modify and, and add resolution where you need to, um, and just yeah, it it's been really really workable. I think uh, you can see like some of the the rooftops I ripped ripped off for the the walkways are underground down here, and oh, yeah. just started applying different materials and, and things like that. I think I might have had to twist some of them into into shape here and there. But uh, Forrest yeah. Forrest has got another good question. He asks, "Are you using instances for trees?" I notice every time I import some tree models to my scene, it starts to chug. Uh, no, I'm not using instances. Um, again, you know, uh, it's something that you can you can definitely do, but I, I just kept it super lightweight. Uh, I, you know, this is way over subdivided than it needs to be, just out of laziness. Um, but you know, it's this is all it is. It's just like one texture off of um, textures.com. Uh, but I think it's like a 1K map. It's already got the, the alpha keyed in. And if you look at it up close, it, it falls apart really quickly. Uh, but once you know the camera path, you can, you can go in and add more. Um, and then I, I did do some higher, slightly higher res trees where, you know, it's, it's basically just the same thing, but modeled a, a trunk and uh, parented a few branches in there. So it looks really crappy up close, but it, it's enough to, to tell you, um, you know, it, it tells a story, like uh, a client or anybody can look at it and be like, okay, trees there, got it. You know, I don't need to worry too much about doing uh, anything crazy. And I just started adding them in because I thought it'd be cool to see the, the car take off and, and kind of interact with them a little bit. So, you know, it's just setting a few keyframes on the tree so it, it kind of blows back as the as the flying car kind of whooshes by it. Mm -hmm. Donda says, I love this workflow. Do you have templates you build off of, or do you build up a scene from scratch each time? Um, no, not really templates. Um, again, like I, I usually don't do too much like this at, at home. So, uh, you know, once I, I got the Utopia kit and kind of opened it up, I just kind of made a, a mental list of the kinds of things I knew I was going to want to add to it. So just like the little walking characters and, and flying cars and, and uh, things like that. Um, I mean, you know, you look at these trainings, like they look like kind of garbage if you just see them just on their, on their own. Um, but they, they whoosh by so fast, just having something with some kind of material breakup, um, does a lot. Mm -hmm. So as far as having a template, um, not really. Um, I do try and keep everything in kind of a real world scale, um, especially with cities when you're, you're doing stuff like this. And I'm probably guilty of it in this scene file of scaling certain things up. You know, but for the most part, you would want to drop like a human in here and it's like a 10 foot floor, 12 foot floor, you know, and not like 50 feet mm -hmm. tall. So just, uh, you know, I, I always either have like a, a six foot cube or, or like a little human in, in the scene file um, for, for anything, really, because it, it's totally easy, especially if you're modeling like a, a vehicle or something like I always want to have just a person in there, really. Um, especially if it's a, a concept vehicle, you know, just to make sure the, the ergonomics of it makes sense and you don't model this awesome thing and then try and put a human on it and it just doesn't make sense. Um, so that, that's that's the only thing I really do as far as a template to keep things grounded. Um, but beyond that, I mean, this was an empty scene file that I imported the kit into and 
went from there. Droki brought in that idea for us when we first got going with the kits, and we have a little astronaut in the kits um, that helps us scale everything now. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it seems like a simple thing, but I, I really think it helps so much. Um, just because that's, you know, something that any human can identify with is seeing a person next to something. It, it adds so much scale. Like if I were to hide all these uh, cars and people and even the, the street lamps, you know, like it, it, um, it can be, you take all that stuff away and it can be a lot harder for people to necessarily be on the same page just looking at something, like how big this world is, you know, mm -hmm. so adding all the little details, um, it, it can uh, really set the scale and, and get everyone on the same page as, as, as to what the scale of this is. Like, it, you know, like this bridge, for example, I, I scaled it up more than the, the bridge when we first fly by, like it's, it's way bigger. So just having a human on there kind of illustrates that if somebody like a set designer or whoever was going to go in and, and start thinking about that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, just, just having the humans on there um, kind of helps ensure that there's no surprises later. Yeah, and it's, it's just having all those these pieces to deal with, you know. It's um, finding a shape you like and, and just using it as, as inspiration for something else, right? Because that's, you know, having just that form language um, already there. Um, even if you start building new pieces, you know, like you could take this and, and maybe you decide that, you know, it, it tapers a little too much at the end, but maybe this is like some kind of housing for the, the train tunnel or something. And, and you could really quickly go in and, uh, and develop ideas further just based on that, you know, like maybe this structure kind of builds out as this thing goes into its flying station or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll do a lot of stuff like that. Um, and, you know, Maybe it works and, and maybe it doesn't, but if it, it's an idea that doesn't work, I've, I've been saved an hour or however long from not going in and modeling something from scratch. And, you know, like I, I can do it in the camera view and tell if it's an idea that's worth uh, developing or not. Mm. How, how do you determine um, how much time to take on risky things that you're like, hmm, I don't know if this is going to work out? And I know it varies project to project, but do you have do you have any any um, rules of thumb on on whether or not you like to risk a lot, or do you, you know how how do you how do you determine where to push and when to stick to your gun? Um, I mean, it's it's there's never anything too crazy for that. You know, it's always driven by by the story. Usually, as as far as it's related to work, and, and things will be figured out enough that you wouldn't usually do. You know, things like this. Um, but, you know, I, I think the big thing is just to always, you know, have everything in a place where you, you can, you know, make those uh, explorations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, just not because I already have a whole city laid out, I guess. You, you don't have to you, – you can have the time to, to take those risks and, and try and figure things out. Um, but yeah, have there been any occasions um, that you that you can talk about where you you've taken a big risk and it and it's and it's fallen flat on its face and you've, you've learned something big from it? <laughs> no, that's never happened to me. Never happened, um, not once. No. Can't believe it. Uh, no, not really. I mean, it's it's the kind of thing we we work so fast. Like I'm I'm just kind of moving verts around as I talk about this. Like it really is, you know. Like okay, that that works or it doesn't. I'm gonna move on. Mm -hmm. um, usually, when we're when we're creating stuff like that, like it it never goes so far down the rabbit hole that you spend a week on something and and it doesn't work out. Um, cause, you know, just from planning and and uh, you know having having things uh, yeah having a goal in mind, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's always room for for exploration, but. Uh, you know, it never never really happens. Short answer is is exploration um, and trying new things part of what what keeps you going every day. Doing this for for seven years in at the at the same craft, did you find that? Yeah, for sure. You know, just because every every project and, and movie is different, um, so just uh, yeah, it, it's always something different, and there's always a, a different technical thing to overcome or. Just a, even a, a different way for, for us to, to do it um, as far as the workflow goes or 
coming up with ways to, to work faster or be able to make more iterations of something. Um, so yeah, it's always super interesting work. I, I think I, you know, I definitely like having the, the short attention span to just be able to come up with an idea until it's, it's good enough to move on and, and then go with it, you know, like really just, uh, you know, just coming up with an idea and, and executing it um, as quickly and efficiently as, as possible. Mm -hmm. Super exciting. Droki says, what a cool way this sort of work has developed your eye or intuition for where details will give you the most bang for your buck, particularly an alien skill set to me. Does does doing this sort of thing make you want to get into uh, get get into more DP work? Um, no, I mean not in particular. Um, it, it definitely I, I try and have uh, you know keep a, a, a fresh eye towards things and and try and just figure out new ways for myself to to create things. And um, again, you know, just just having this stuff has, has been really great. <laughs> It's really just a, a Lego set that you can go in and, and start coming up with ideas, um, you know, because this, this is the kind of thing, you know, especially when when you work full time and, you know, you just want to be able to, you know, do something of your own. It's so cool just to have uh, something to start with that uh, you can start to make your own and develop your own ideas. And uh, it's, it's just been a really, a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, beyond that, I, I just like being able to, to make cool stuff and, and come up with uh, cool ideas and, and always just try and uh, figure out new and better ways to do it. Because um, you always, you know, every every month you feel like you, you see somebody online come up with like a new technique or, or workflow for, for doing something and you're like, wow, that's that's really cool. And uh, I just try and, and apply that same, you know, logic and innovation to, to kind of what I do. Um, and uh, it's it's been fun. Well, you've certainly made something super cool here, man, and it, it's it's so inspiring for us. What we what we seek to do with Kit Bash is to enable and inspire other artists, and it's so great to hear someone like you say that these are helpful in enabling your personal projects to to come to life while you're spending so much time in the um, you know on the on the biggest stage there is. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, it's definitely what, a lot of fun. what kind of advice would you give to, to say, a, a, a someone who's just jumping in, maybe maybe eighteen months in, and and has the thought, maybe previs is for me. What 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 do you think? What what kind of advice would you give them on how to jump in and explore that at a really early stage? Um, you know, it, it depends. Like, if you want to be an animator, definitely take as many animation classes as you can, and also paying attention to uh, to cameras and and uh, realistic camera moves and uh, just being able to, to block animation fast and, and quickly and, and from the asset side, um, just being able to work light and, and quickly um, and not getting too caught up in, in details like, uh, you know, is it fully quadded out or, you know, if I baked all the maps and, and things like that, like you'll, you'll see a lot of people you know, focusing on the wrong sort of details or, or saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing the textures on the, the underside of this chamfer here. And you're like, well, it's just knowing, knowing what the, the end goal is and, and how your assets being used. And, and uh, at the end of the day, like these are all just ideas, you know, it's, it's never going to be the, the final thing, um, but it's something that you could go in and, and final if you wanted to. Um, so just having that in mind, uh, that this is ultimately something that's going to, uh, you know, just be used to, to guide the final product. Um, you know, like we can we can turn over our, our 3D scene files. So as, as long as things make sense in, in 3D and uh, tell the story and it works accurately, that's that's kind of the, the big things to, to look for rather than putting all the, the polish in the world on it. Because, you know, with all the tools and everything nowadays, like Newport keeps getting better and better, um, you know, you can you can do a lot of stuff, and there's there's got to be you know ways I don't even think about to really present these things quickly and and uh, and really just get your getting your ideas out there quickly and efficiently. It's I, I think it's so cool to to how much you can do so fast on your own, and to to live in the generalist world where you can can really push things and create in the way that tools are changing now. You can you can get something so far along. You can tell such a a thorough story um, 
in so little time, right? Do you see a world um, in the future where where generalists are able to crank out um, their own kind of narratives uh, individually? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I think that the tools are getting so much better and better, and people are getting just crazy amounts of skills. I, I think we're, we're definitely um, getting to a place where people can can get out there and, and create whatever they want really it's it's just having um the tools and resources um that are available today uh really are making it easier and easier to to go in and um and and do this stuff so yeah for sure and it's it's exciting to think um you know where it'll be even a couple of years from now right um, especially yep. with you know game engine stuff and just the the things that you, one person can make alone is just you couldn't even do it 10 years ago um yeah it's it's pretty cool. I mean, we're seeing it over and over again in, in short form online. And you yeah. know, we see so many um, young guys out there cranking out their own short films and, and quick internet animations all the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and just, you know, when it's just one person or a small group of people, like if you have a clear plan and, and know what you want to do, you can, you can achieve a really polished look really efficiently I think and I think that's only going to be something that uh, is going to become easier and easier. Have you spent any time in a, in, in real time game engines? Um, not really um, beyond just kind of messing around with it um, on my own but uh, I, I haven't really done anything um, yet. I, I would like to definitely eventually uh, but uh, as, of, as of yet I, I have not gone down uh, the, the Unreal or, or Unity path other than just dumping stuff in to move it around in real time. Yeah. Um, Trey Trimble has joined us in the room and says, I just want to say, hey, uh, you guys are amazing and thank you. Uh, Trey, thank you. Awesome uh, awesome to have you with us and, and thank you for the support. Um, that Hearing you say that and bringing value to you guys is why we do this. So thank you for, for being part of this. Um, Hunt, tell me what, um, if you could say in the next three years, anything professionally, you can have your, your dream come true. What do you think that is? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I, I do get to work on, on really cool things. So I, I feel like in a, in a way I'm already kind of there. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, just being able to create my own stuff more is, is fun too. Yeah. Um, and you know, but between things like this and, and just, uh, where, where all the tools are going, it, it does get easier and easier. Um, like I said, with a, a limited amount of time, just like a half hour here and there, um, over the course of a couple of weeks, you can you can put something together. And this is with no real narrative goal in, in mind or anything. Um, so so yeah, I, I think uh, I just want to keep doing more of the same. Keep you know pushing my own skill set and trying to make things look more realistic um, with. Uh, you know, limited, um, without, without putting crazy, crazy detail into it and just always finding ways to, to push that and to, to make interesting things that, uh, or, you know, hopefully people enjoy. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's so cool to, to be where you are hunting to, that you'd spend the time with us today to, to break down this piece and, and, and show us a, a little bit of insight into, into your world working on some of the, the biggest projects in, in modern history. I think, I think it's really, it's really awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it, it really is. It's almost therapeutic to be able to just go in and, and have all these cool buildings to just start moving around and, and laying out. This is the kind of thing I, I think I just wouldn't even have the interest in, in doing it myself just for, for this. So, uh, just as you know, like a, a design or, or layout exercise, it's it's really great just to be able to to have this as a resource, you know. Um, and I think that's it's it's just a great thing. So so thank you guys. Hunt, I, I'd like to ask, what do you think is one of the keys to professionalism for you? What is what do you think it is that that makes a real professional in your field? Just the ability to. Um, not get too attached to anything, you know, just being early on in production, you know, things change and just, uh, you know, being able to, to 
roll with the punches and um, and you know know that it's it's always because things evolve and, and get better. Um, but it, you know, there's there's definitely always something you're gonna make that that's not gonna make it to the, the final product because it, it's just a such a, an early on part of, of the process. Um, you know, just just being able to, to, to do that and to uh, just adapt to things uh, is, is really, you know, a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, so, so few skills as valuable as being flexible. Just in, in, <laughs> yeah. in general, and I think in especially in the in the previs world, where like you said, you're coming in right at the beginning, and then there's going to be so many different people, um, so many artists who are going to take what you've done and, and build from it, and and I'm sure you're getting notes all the time to 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 maneuver, and I think I think that's that's a really cool note, the idea to to be flexible. Yeah, um, and it's it's uh, you know it's a super collaborative thing, and. I'm, I'm lucky to work with a, a lot of really awesome people and you know everybody just is always pushing to make each other better and uh, I think that's a, a great uh, a great uh, advantage and, and thing to, to have um, is, is just always you know being around a, a group of people that, that make you want to push harder and, and really come up with new ways to, to do do more with uh, you know with uh, the tools you have available Mm -hmm. Trey asks about something that we kind of touched on earlier, but I think he's, he's got a good point. He says, my struggle is to know when to stop tweaking. You know, I can become a perfectionist. And do, you del <laughs> do you deal with that, or how do you know when is enough? Um, yeah, no, you never really know. Like, I, you know, I could probably spend 10 more hours on this thing, or I could just never open it again. Um, I think uh, the big thing is, is knowing, like, to, to avoid over-tweaking something is – knowing what your final output is, whether it's like a still concept art image or an animation or a scene, and just knowing what that, that final thing is, you know, like if, if this was my final image, but it, you know, it, it definitely is like a sandbox. Like it, it is fun to go in and, and just, you know, animate stuff flying around or, or just do little things or wanting to add way more detail or make the buildings look better or build the, sh you know, like you could, you could go down that, that road forever um so you know um it's definitely hard to fight but you know i think yeah knowing the final output is the biggest thing i think you know trey says it's it's awful but I'm, I'm glad to hear that i'm not alone in that and i think everyone who um who has sought to push some boundary in, in art feels that and yeah. you know i think that's one of the beautiful things about deadlines if you can have deadlines and set deadlines, and I know with personal work, it's it's difficult to do. I've heard we've had some artists come on and say that they set timers, and they set timers yeah. for, for not just the project as a whole, but for little parts of the project. Uh, yeah, I, I actually did exactly that for the the flying cars. I think I only have three or four variations zooming around here, but they're literally just primitives. I think I set a, a five minute timer, and once I was the timer went off, I was just done. On to the next one. Um, so that, that can be a, a valid way to go too. And it, it's, it's also, you know, it's just giving yourself a deadline, whether it's for yourself or, you know, like me doing like this, this talk, like it, it gives you something like, I, I got to do this cause people are going to see it or I'm going <laughs> to, you know, so, so that's good. And, uh, you know, and I, I still like to take online classes and stuff, um, just because it's the same thing, you know, like you're, you, you just got to put yourself out there in the world and know like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I know other people are going to see, so I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, cause it, it's super easy if you're just working freelance or in a job to not have any, any time for yourself at, at the end of this, uh, at the end of your, your day, whenever that is. Um, so just kind of giving yourself, uh, goals and, and things to, you know, push yourself mm -hmm. to want to even make something, um, I think is, is super helpful because otherwise you can totally go down the rabbit hole of just being, you know, I'm going to detail out this one car and, and not worry about the, the rest of the scene. Uh -huh. It's, um, it's, I think that's such a great look at, at all of life. You know, you balance and trying to find the, the right amount of time to allocate towards the different factors of our lives as a whole yeah. is something that, that is really important that we so rarely it's so easy to just get lost in tunnel vision down one part of our life and then 
forget that you got a bunch of different things you need to handle. If, if any of you out there are, um, are looking for a challenge, I think this is a great one. Put yourself on a timer and see what you can do within those time constraints. Because working on a deadline is is probably the most human thing we could do, um, given that that any professional environment, as well as just our lifeline, is built around some form of deadline. And if you don't have a deadline or you don't have someone else imposing a deadline, put one on yourself and see what happens. Um, and I think it's a fantastic exercise to just throw 30 minutes on the clock and, and see what can happen. Well, I think this is, uh, this is such a, a great place to go. I just want to uh, gather up the last comments. Droki says, I just want to send a huge thank you to Hunt for stopping by and sharing your workflow. So such a cool sneak peek into this, this side of the industry and I think that few of us know about really enlightening several cool. people several people second that um and uh, uh forest lamb says i'm jumping on the edo japan kit soon this advice is going to help me out so much wasted so much time on my last project uh, <laughs> yeah we've, we've all been there well um, speaking of deadlines cool. um we have to stick to our our time constraint here we, we've taken an hour of hunt's time that he has so graciously given us um we couldn't thank you enough, Hunt. Um, really, it's it's your work is is so special. I know to, to us and so many people around the world, and um, and it's so cool of you to, to spend this hour here and, and share some of that with us. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you want to uh, stop screen sharing, we can we can see your your face as we as we go on out here. Um, yeah, let's do it. A, a couple little uh, shout outs here. Um, JD Hilliard has put the Discord link in there. Um, and uh, he has said thanks, Hunt, for sharing. Um, cool. Thank you. Uh, Jiroki has re-brought up that I am here. Um, thank you all for bearing with me on my laptop today because I am here in Boston um, where we're showcasing Sleep Tight, our video game. Um, so right behind me in this wall is a huge convention where uh, it'll all go down this week. So if you're out there, come say what's up to us. Um, if not, um, keep up with us on Discord throughout the week. Um, hit us up on social media. You can also find Hunt on social media. Um, go uh, comment on all of his Instagram posts because they rock. Um, and uh, and that's, uh, that's our show today.